What could possibly possess a young man to embark on a journey to a place called the white man's grave? For zoologist Mark Linfield, what makes this dangerous journey to the Congo worth every risk is the chance to photograph the magnificent lowland gorilla, an animal which has eluded scientists and filmmakers alike. This is the story of his incredible adventure. We'll follow him into a jungle so remote that the gorillas there had never seen a human being before. Mark Linfield is a zoologist with a passion for gorillas. But those he wants to see and photograph live in the great jungle of the Congo Basin, a vast region straddling the equator in Central Africa. Here, rainforest and rivers stretch across an area half the size of the United States. His plane touches down in Brazzaville, the capital and river port of the Republic of the Congo. He's at the threshold of an adventure that may prove the most exciting and arduous of his life. This bustling city seems a world away from the jungle that is home to the lowland gorillas. Mark is anxious to escape the city and begin his journey. No one's ever filmed wild lowland gorillas before, and it's a challenge I've always wanted to take on. Even after months of planning, it seems daunting. And at this stage, I have no idea if I'll succeed. Mark's adventure begins at the city zoo with young gorillas. These are baby lowland gorillas. They're smaller and more lightly colored than their rarer and more famous cousins, the mountain gorillas. These youngsters are only about three years old, and all are orphans. Their parents were killed. Though it is illegal, wild gorillas are still hunted in Central Africa for a variety of reasons. And tragically, their youngsters are left on their own. These were rescued and brought here to the orphanage in Brazzaville, set up by the British conservationist John Aspinall with the blessing of Congolese authorities. It's now supervised by Mark and Helen Atwater. Yeah, she, she had an eye infection, actually. 
a fungal infection on her face and she was really thin. How was that one, Mark? Um, just a bit over four months. Well, between four and five. Actually, it's quite big for his age, as you can see. But it, um, it does vary between individuals. Mark, Helen and the staff act as both doctors and parents to these youngsters. When they arrive, they are like abused children, weak, sick and withdrawn. They must be nursed back to health. All these young will have watched their parents killed in front of them. Only the hardiest reach the orphanage. The ultimate objective is to release these orphans into a specially protected forest. But for now, they spend most of their day in the jungle just outside the orphanage. As a zoologist, Mark Linfield knows the orphans should not have too much contact with people if they're ever to be released back into the wild. But sometimes he just can't resist. This is Mark's first encounter with the gorillas. He does his best to keep up with the daily activities. He has a difficult time when the day's outing takes place in the top of a tree. Staff members do their best to teach these orphans how to be gorillas. After a few months in the orphanage, most of the youngsters regain their health, confidence, and curiosity. Currently, the Brazzaville Orphanage is home to 14 baby lowland gorillas. Many local people have a superstitious fear of gorillas. At first, they were afraid to join the staff of the orphanage. Soon they discovered that the gorillas were not only harmless, they were fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
But outside the orphanage, gorillas are still being hunted for three reasons. They're killed mainly for food, but they're also sold for research purposes and as fetishes. Before heading upriver into the interior of the Congo, Mark must wait a few days for a boat. He spends an afternoon in Brazzaville's marketplace. Here, he discovers fetishes, parts of animals believed to be imbued with special qualities which can be passed on to people. Head of snake, talon of eagle, skin of genet, and the foot of a gorilla. For many Congolese, such charms have the power to heal. It is believed that certain parts of a gorilla will make sick children well. As an outsider, I felt rather uneasy in this market and was glad that my time in Brazzaville was coming to an end. But there's another Africa, older than mankind, and that's where Mark must go in quest of wild gorillas. Old Africa beside the new. Between two capital cities, Brazzaville in the Congo and Kinshasa in Zaire, there flows the second largest river in the world. Rivaled only by the Amazon, the Congo, as it was once known, captures the imagination of all who see it. Today, it's called the Zaire River, a 3,000-mile highway to the heart of Africa. For most who venture inland, this floating town is the only form of transportation they can afford. More than 2,000 people crowd onto this cluster of nine timber barges. They're pushed by a couple of struggling tugboats against the relentless flow of this gigantic river. A full-scale market springs up to feed and supply the passengers. It's oppressively hot and dank. Bottled soft drinks are safest, but they're served warm and do little to quench a tropical thirst. Obviously, there's plenty of water, but unfortunately, it's unsafe to drink. Mark passes the time exploring the various markets and comes across a makeshift drugstore. For most people, reject Western medicines are the only alternative to fetish magic. They're always out of date, have no directions for use, and not even the vendors know what's inside most of them. On a voyage like this, I find any distraction is welcome. Read, sleep, eat, or engage in a local beauty routine. On this journey, Mark makes many friends. 
These are the lighter moments on a long and difficult voyage. Progress is slow. It's taken the barge six days to travel just 200 miles. For Mark, the last two weeks have also been a culinary adventure. Every day I have a hundred kitchens to choose from. Today I've already turned down chimp stew, crocodile steaks and ribs of colobus monkey. This lady's preparing catfish. In his book, Heart of Darkness, Joseph Conrad wrote, Going upriver was like going back to the earliest beginnings of the world, where vegetation rioted on the earth and the big trees were kings. An empty stream, a great silence, an impenetrable forest. Nearly a century later, the forest has been penetrated, the silence broken, and the big trees dethroned from their kingdom. With the help of foreign loans, the natural riches of the Congo are being extracted for export. It takes but a moment to cut down an African mahogany tree that has taken centuries to grow. It costs so much to transport the trees from the interior that many of the timber companies go bankrupt. The country loses the wood and is left only with the debt and empty shores. Morning begins slowly and quietly, and sometimes ends with a rousing religious service. Every day, longboats known as pirogues come from the shore to catch up with this great shipborne market. These traders are selling bush meat. Animals they've trapped in the forest or caught in the river. Bush meat is the most important source of protein in the Congo. 40,000 tons are eaten every year colobus monkeys and antelopes, wild pigs, elephants and chimps. 500 lowland gorillas are killed every year. 
A monkey is being smoked to preserve its meat. Most of the bush meat for sale on board has already been prepared and smoked ashore in riverside villages inhabited by commercial hunters. The barge has now turned back to Brazzaville with a cargo of timber. Sixteen days into his journey, Mark has reached the northern Congo. He now travels by Pirogue, which is more suited to this shallow river, the Sangha, one of the many tributaries of the Congo. Mark will get no farther unless he enlists local help. He'll find it here in Bomasa village. In these parts, a visit from Mondele, or white man, is still a rare event. Thankfully, they seem pleased to see me. I realize I've got no chance of finding gorillas without their help. The chief of Bomasa greets Mark on the shore. Some of the villagers are Bantu people, the others are pygmies. If anyone can lead Mark to lowland gorillas, it will be the pygmies. They hunt gorillas for the Bantu, who eat and trade them. It's part of the long-standing cooperative relationship between these two groups. There is great excitement over Mark's arrival. It's cause for celebration. The chief recommends Mabai as the best of all the pygmy trackers. His stories about what the remote forests may hold sound really exciting. But a previous experience with a guide has left me cautious. We also need a porter. He chooses a man called Jokin, renowned for his strength. He'll accompany us part of the way and we agree to leave the following morning. The pygmies tell Mark he can find gorillas in a remote forest called Indoki, meaning dark magic or sorcerer. No one has ever lived there and hunters avoid it. The two guides, Jokin and Mobai, lead Mark into the forest that surrounds the village. Spines and thorns tear at flesh, insects bite, the heat is stifling. And so begins the most challenging part of this journey in search of the great apes. Unlike the river, the water here is quite clean, yet Mark cannot afford to take any chances with his health. 
He'll have to boil the water at camp before he can drink it. The pygmies put their trust in their forest god, Jengi, as they make their way deeper and deeper into the forest. After a day with leeches and mud, Mark tries to get clean and comfortable. The timing of this journey is critical. In the wet season, the water level here would make this swamp impassable. It's difficult enough in the dry season. It's a long way to the Indoki forest. These swamps, the river, and the rugged highlands to the north act like a natural fortress for Indoki. Humans are a rare sight for these colobus monkeys. Rarely has any human made it beyond these swamps. It's easy to see why. I'm a blank. It's a primeval place where, according to legend, lurks a strange beast. The pygmies claim Congo's swamps a home to a dinosaur-like creature called Mokalium bembi. Such an animal isn't too improbable. These swamps embrace areas where the climate and vegetation have remained virtually unchanged for millions of years. These places have acted as havens for plants and animals that would otherwise have become extinct. Our efforts trigger eruptions of marsh gas. The air stinks of rotting eggs. The stench is overpowering. Every foothold is precarious. You can't let your concentration lapse for a moment. I'm beginning to feel overwhelmed by exhaustion. I'm not sure I can go much further. It's easy to see why hunters avoid this place. I never thought I could be this happy to see sunlight and clean water. After the experience of the last few days, the contrast is worth savouring.
When tracking or hunting, Mobai and Jokin believe it's important to think and behave like the animals thereafter, which do not bathe. Now, Endoki has one more obstacle to put in their way. Mobai and Jokin know the terrain that lies ahead. They have to build a boat for the final leg of the journey. With the speed and skill of generations of pygmy craftsmen, they transform a log into a pirogue. Those past days battling across the swamps, I was cut by thorns, bitten by dozens of species of ants, and goodness knows how much blood I lost to biting flies. They will destroy the boat after they've used it. Otherwise, poachers could find a free ride into the interior. Jokin and Mabai don't want me to help. We all know I'd only upset the boat. I get a chance to sit back and relax. At last, they arrive at Indoki, a pristine wilderness unchanged since the last ice age. Conservationists are hoping to save this natural treasure by setting aside a reserve here that may protect Indoki from loggers, but it may also bring researchers, workers, and tourists. Mark, Mobai, and Jokin must now proceed on foot into the sorcerer's forest. Sanza <laughs> 
to koma loko lambula zo mie mama na baze bambongo baloki ya butie na te bambongo me melanga tita e na kati ya kinye vema na koka moye sila e from a bye and joking the night is a spooky time of leopards and spirits, nowhere more so than in this forest. They believe their songs can be sensed by their families far away in the village. Tomorrow, Jokin will go home. Mabai and I will go on alone, looking for the gorillas. The Ndoki forest is seven and a half million acres of virgin jungle, perhaps the last major unexplored rainforest on this planet. Forbidding, inaccessible, mysterious, and teeming with life. a bimba fruit, and it bears the tooth marks of a gorilla. Fresh dung, confirming that gorillas can't be too far ahead. Gorillas slept here last night. The bedding of sticks and leaves is fresh. It's possible there's a family nearby. The forest changes character, becoming more open. The leaves underfoot are dry and full of ants. A family of gorillas might find a meal here. And where there are plenty of ants, there's also likely to be one of the strangest creatures in the world. A scaly anteater, or pangolin. The pangolin looks reptilian, but it's actually a mammal. When threatened, it curls up into an impenetrable ball. Mark and Mobai let the pangolin return to its daily rounds, hunting for ants and termites. They come upon evidence of a gorilla's recent meal of ants. Mabai is an expert at reading the subtle clues of the forest. He knows there are only steps behind the gorillas.
Success! My first wild lowland gorilla. But frankly, I'm scared to death. Being in the presence of a wild gorilla for the first time is an awesome experience. I'm never going to forget this moment. Both Mark and Mobai are apprehensive. A 500-pound, agitated, lowland gorilla is cause for concern. But gorillas are naturally unaggressive, and unless threatened, there's little danger. The Indoki gorillas have never seen humans before. This male reacts with astonishment and curiosity. He tries to get closer and closer for a good look at these forest intruders. Encouraged by his first encounter, Mark hopes to find a family to photograph. He heads to an area that the pygmies call a bai, a natural clearing in the forest. Many animals come to these byes to graze on the swamp grass. This is a sitatunga, a kind of African antelope. Its long splayed hooves prevent it from sinking into the Indoki swamp. Like many forest animals, Forest buffalo are smaller than their relatives on the African plains, but they can still be just as aggressive and will charge if threatened. Mark and Mobai stay hidden in the surrounding forest. But Mark's quarry is gorillas, so they continue their search. Mobai's father once spoke of a very large clearing in this forest where gorillas would forage. Mobai hopes to find it. There's no way to hurry through this muddy, tangled forest. But both men know they have little time left. They're running out of supplies and will have to turn back soon. Mobai has found the clearing.
Mark and Mabai know this is their last chance to find gorillas. Flawless otters seem to welcome them. A red seed cracker takes little notice. The clearing is a winter refuge for migrant waders. This wood sandpiper may have flown all the way from Scotland or even Siberia. The migrants have come to feed on worms and shrimps in these muddy ponds. Resident birds, like these heartlob ducks, also enjoy the bountiful food found in these clearings. Piles of dung on the shore indicate that elephants have been here earlier in the day to drink. Pirate butterflies crowd each other to sip the salty water. This is an African bird wing, the size of a hand. In order to get enough minerals, it must drink a lot of water. Most of the fluid is then excreted. Some Hadada ibises enjoy a leisurely bath. In a forest without hunters, colobus monkeys have little to fear. They descend from the trees in pursuit of crickets and grasshoppers to supplement their leafy diet. Mobai leads Mark to another part of the clearing. At last. real home. I've already forgotten the hardships of getting here. This big male is up to his haunches in the swamp. That's exciting in itself. Gorillas were generally thought to avoid wet places. Obviously, we were wrong. This large male is the leader of the family now entering the clearing. He's called the silverback.
Another mature male joins the group, but he's keeping his distance from the dominant male. A young gorilla has to be carried through the swamp on its mother's back. Gorillas are mainly vegetarians. Today, Indoki's swampy brew provides them with a feast of wild onions. This is the first time lowland gorillas have ever been filmed in the wild. It's great to know that despite all the changes elsewhere, there is still a place where the animals don't even know what a human looks like. If only there were more places like it. What a thrilling end to my journey to Central Africa. The swamps and thick jungle around Ndoki have protected these gorillas from people for thousands of years. Let's hope it remains this way for many more. <laughs>